Salutare prieteni, ne uităm la cel mai recent videoclip al lui Alex de la History Legends, videoclip intitulat Trupele de asalt rusești forțează fortăreața Abdiivka. Foarte interesant, subtitrarea va fi în josul ecranului pe televizor aș, iar cei care urmăresc pe telefon, da, și vi se pare că fontul este prea mic, să sfătuiți să întoarcă telefonul din poziția asta normală, să-l întoarcă pe orizontală, astfel videoclipul se va întinde pe tot ecranul, în consecință și subtitrările vor fi mai dodoloați. Bun? Și cei care tot nu văd și nu pricep nici engleză, pot să facă zoom cu două degete pe telefon în zona subtitrărilor. Let's go! My friends, the battle of Adivka has been raging for four months. And it feels more and more like Bakhmut 2.0. We went from why Russia's push to capture Antivka Fortress is unlikely to succeed to Russia's tiny Peric advances in... Așa, ce înseamnă avansuri pirice, da? De exemplu, o victorie pirică înseamnă atunci când o armată obține din punct de vedere tehnic victoria, numai că pierde atât de mulți soldați și echipamente, încât mai bine nu se mai apuca de luptă. Sfârșește mai rău decât era la început. Și probabil următoarele lupte ei vor fi fatale. Bun. In Ukraine's East and now um, yeah. the Institute of the Study of War records movements of Russian troops through Avdivka streets. <laughs> și știți cum s-a întâmplat faza asta? We are winning! Through massive count. <laughs> Cum? Deci, pe măsură, da? Ăștia sunt ruși. Pe măsură ce au început să strângă în jurul orașului Avdiivka, da? La un moment dat, nu știu ce au făcut ei, ce au scotocit, ce n-au scotocit, ideea e că au găsit o conduct. Și au spus, ia să vedem unde duce conducta asta, da? Și au luat-o frumos pe sub pământ, au parcurs vreo 2 km, probabil că au dat o gură de canal la o parte, s-au trezit pe străzile din Avdiivka. Și imaginați-vă surpriza Soldaților ucraineni când s-au trezit cu rușii în spate. <laughs> Tare. Și aproape te întrebă, da, ucrainenii care pregătesc fortăreața Abdivka din 2014 cu acea, chiar nu știau de conducta aia? Bă, se pare că nu știau, da? Și rușii cum vor fi găsit-o totuși? Și aici mă gândesc că probabil rușii când avansează sunt foarte atenți pe ce calcă, da? Cine știe ce mine sau alte surprize îi mai așteaptă și poate cumva în felul ăsta au găsit și conducta aia subterană. Russia gives up on encircling Avdivka, oh. although the original title of the Ukrainian article is Russia fails to surround Avdivka, prepares for urban block by block fights. That's right, while Russian aviation is flattening the city, Russian assault squads are now storming Avdivka proper from the north, the east, and the south. Here's everything they captured in the past days alone. The new voice of Ukraine interviewed yes, captured in the past days alone. The new voice of Ukraine interviewed military expert Alexander Kovalenko and he said very clearly Avdivka will be much more difficult to defend than Bakhmut. Logistics are more limited there. I mean we already spoke about this for months. But what shocked me is what the journalist asked next. Will the Ukrainian forces have time to withdraw from the city if the need arises? Yeah. Fuck. For Ukraine, the political impasse of the withdrawal compels them to waste precious manpower on the city they know they cannot hold. At the same time, Ukraine is also building a brand new line of fortifications just 16 uh -huh. kilometers okay. west of Avdivka. Oh, and guess who decided to show up in Avdivka? Aiden Aslid. The last time he was seen on the battlefield, Ukraine suffered a major defeat in Mariupol and he surrendered with thousands of other Ukrainian soldiers. Pia a Ok, și-a făcut damblaua și acum Abdivica este condamnat. Odiers. 
Honestly, I was preparing a video on how the Avdivka front came to a standstill. That's when the Russians pulled off an incredible operation that Hollywood could not have even dreamed Yo, of. The conducta. Within almost 24 conducta. hours, <laughs> the front south of Avdivka went from this to that. A two kilometer breakthrough right into the heart of the city. And the mainstream media is coping hard because the Russians piped the Ukrainians real good. I <laughs> suppose <laughs> Russians piped the Ukrainians. The uh, Russians pipat sau iau conductat <laughs> pe ucraineni. Da. <laughs> And let me tell you, it got messy. I mean, quite literally, there's no other way to put it. What happened is that some time ago, Russian intelligence officers found the entry of an old Soviet-era underground pipeline or sewage leading into Evdivka. This pipe led directly underneath the Ukrainian stronghold called the Tsar's Hunt. No. Thing is, it was completely flooded under maximum secrecy. They cleared the path by hand through the icy and muddy water. Wow. The noise of these miners and engineers working was covered with active artillery and mortar fire on top of their position. A first attempt to storm Ukraine positions failed due to a lack of oxygen. So the workers went back and added additional ventilation holes. That's when the Russian command launched Operatie Truba, or Operation Pipe. <laughs> On January 17th, an assault force of 150 was gathered. Men from the Ministry of Defense's Deshaka, or Volunteer Assault Corps. They pushed two kilometers on the ground and at once they emerged from the ground right behind the enemy's back. A bit like a modern day Trojan horse. <laughs> After that, dozens of small Russian infantry squads spread out behind enemy lines and went on to storm the stronghold of the Tsar's hunt. <laughs> The Ukraine garrison was taken by surprise and completely destroyed, and many Ukraine soldiers simply surrendered. And we can clearly see that many of these stormtroopers were former Wagnerians. From there, the Ukrainians lost countless fighting positions, and whose defenders did not understand how the enemy was suddenly surrounding them. I'll tell you more about this operation in a minute. We'll look at how it even came to be and what this means for the overall battle of Avivka. And what's crazy is that 160 years ago, the Russians used this same exact tactic to infiltrate the citadel of Shimkent in modern-day Kazakhstan. In 1864, the scouts of Russian General Mikhail Chernayev found the fortress's water supply pipe. The following night, a special detachment entered the pipeline and took the city by storm. And that's how Shinkent fell without significant resistance. Welcome to History Legends and here are the latest news of the Russo-Ukrainian War. If you're new to this channel, make sure to like and subscribe. As you know, some of my Ukraine videos have been targeted with limited or no ads. So make sure to check out my Patreon or PayPal to keep the show running. Da. Thank you to everyone that has watched. And the same rugăminte, I have for you. Don't forget to hit the like button and to continue. Really helped. And welcome to the headquarters. This is Abdivka, this mining city in Donbass for which both sides are throwing everything. In one of my previous videos, we talked about the Ukrainian supply lines going into Abdivka. We correctly determined the route going from Ocheritine to Novobakhmutivka and Orlivka. However, according to GPS signals, Russian intelligence officers found a second route to the south from Netailove going towards that same Orlivka. And the reasons the Russians have not been able to close off the encirclement is exactly because of that. The Ukrainians are fighting tooth and nail to protect these vital supply lines. On the 12th of January, it was reported that additional Ukrainian reinforcements arrived in Birdishi, as well as in the industrial zone to strengthen the defense of the city. The Ukrainian command properly applied the theory of the three T's. Never let the two tips touch. And because of that, Russian assault squads have been struggling to break through, and multiple assault columns have just been hammered by Ukrainian artillery, thus making it very hard for the Russians to bring reinforcements and supplies to the contact line. On this map, you can see the artillery fire concentration on the Avdivka front between the 13th and the 23rd of January. If we translate this onto a big map, 
these are all the areas that have been shelled in the past 10 days. And this clearly means this is where the bulk of the fighting is currently taking place at. Russian aviation is also extremely active, as you can see with this footage of this Su-25 fighter aircraft. Here you can see a very interesting FPV drone attack on a Ukrainian trench network. What I wanted to show you is its geolocation. So here's a railway line, and then there's this 90 degree angled tree line. If we translate this onto the map, once again the railway line, the 90 degree tree line, and the Ukrainian fortified bastion must be positioned right here. The video was released on January 16th, but according to pro-Ukrainian Deep State UA, this same position was conquered by the Russians on January 1st. What turns out, the Ukrainians recently recaptured these trenches during a counterattack. A bit further to the north, Russian TOS flamethrowers shelled Ukrainian positions, which, according to Deep State, is in the gray zone. So as you can see, the Russian push towards Ocheretine has been bottlenecked by all the Ukrainian counterattacks. And that made the Russians very salty. All over the Avdivka front, the Ukrainians tried to push back the Russians. For example, a couple of days ago on the southern flank, Russian artillery bombarded forward Ukrainian positions. Thing is, those Ukrainian entrenchments were geolocated right here on the map, meaning the overall Russian push against Sverne has stalled. I mean, there's barely any progress in weeks. On the 12th of January, NATO bots went nuts because of this spectacular duel between two Bradley IFVs and a Russian T-90 in the village of Stepovit. In this zoomed-in footage, we can clearly see the Bradley's 25mm automatic cannon ripping through the Russian tank. And all these explosions you can see are due to the tank's explosive reactive armor on contact with the 25mm shells. From this other angle, you can also see how the Bradley outmaneuvered the enemy tank. And that's where the video cuts. But in the long version, the T-90 was far from destroyed. As a matter of fact, it safely withdrew to friendly lines. I mean, sort of. That's when the T-90 was hit by FPV drones. And only then did the crew abandon the tank. Check out this interview with one of the Ukrainian... Crew members of that Bradley. On top of that, in that same drone footage, we clearly see Ukrainian artillery shelling enemy held positions in the village of Stepove, confirming the fact that the Russians are indeed in control of that settlement. Like we have seen in my previous videos, all the 47th Mechanized Brigade can do is to launch hit and run attacks with their Bradleys. But it seems Ukraine doesn't have the actual manpower to reclaim that settlement. And the situation will become extremely critical the moment the Russians advance just one kilometer to the west towards Berdyshi, as this will seriously cripple the Ukrainian logistics towards Avdivka. It's GG well played. In response to these raids, the Russians are specifically targeting these infantry fighting vehicles, like this FPV preying on the Bradley dug in into the tree line. Turns out this Ukrainian armored vehicle was geolocated right here near Novobakhmutivka. This would confirm the theory that the Russians are actually bypassing Stepove and have rather decided to push along this tree line. But like we have seen earlier, it is proving difficult as well. That's where the Ukrainians regain control of this set of trenches. On the 17th of January, we can see a group of 12 Russian stormtroopers pushing along that same tree line. That's when they got intercepted by multiple FPV drones, which caused at least six casualties. For now, I can say much more about the northern sector. Oh yeah, actually there's one more thing. That same Bradley driver that did the interview had sure. something else to say yeah. a week later. We can now assume his Bradley is kaput. And this strangely coincides with this video of the <laughs> M2 Bradley near Stepovic.
Meanwhile, this Russian artillery battery is seen releasing huge loads right next to the coke plant. Using their footage, we can determine that this was the point of view of the drone. And we can see exactly what Ukrainian positions they bombarded. And on the 20th of January, swarms of Russian FPV drones fell on Ukrainian troops in that same sector. This could mean two things. Either the Ukrainians are attempting to flank step away from the industrial area, or the Russians are in the process of softening Ukrainian positions before launching the assault on the coke plant. At the same time, Russian assault detachments captured the water pumping station and creeped their way forward in the suburban area east of the factory. After this attack from the north, the idea was to launch a simultaneous flanking attack from the east to support the main assault, and ideally gain a solid foothold in the suburban area of Avdivka. In this drone footage from the 16th of January, you can see a column of seven tanks and BMPs pushing forward under the cover of a snowstorm. The armored column most likely came from this direction, and then crossed this field where they got targeted by the artillery of the Ukrainian 110 Mechanized Brigade. Despite inflicting losses on the enemy, Dipstead UA had no other choice but to identify all the sector as captured by the Russians. And on the 27th, the Russians tried again with another armored column. This time they pushed through this first tree line, where some riflemen jumped off the BMPs, meaning they were disembarked somewhere here. The rest of the column continued across this field, hoping to get control of this tree line, until they were halted by either mines or artillery forcing the entire assault formation to pull back. As part of this offensive east of Avdivka, Russian aviation launched multiple FAB bombs on this high ground, thus making it very hard for the Ukrainians to reinforce these positions. And as of the 19th of January, Ukrainian forces only held this set of tree lines. If the Russians continue their attacks, the Ukrainian flanks will be exposed and they will be forced to abandon their positions or face encirclement. During all this time, the southern part of Avdivka remained very silent. A bit too silent. I mean, after the Russians captured the Promka industrial area in December, they didn't make much progress. This forested area, all this bush, acted as an impenetrable shield. Ukrainians can hide a lot of troops there, and the sector has been steadily fortified since 2014. I mean, you can see it for yourself on Google Earth. There are trenches everywhere and that means they date back from years ago there's a reason we call abdivka a fortress so you can imagine the extent of the fortifications now for weeks russian detachments have tried to find a gap in the enemy defenses for example here you can see a member of the tiger recon unit firing an rpg at the ukrainians the ukrainian positions in the forested area were supported by two main strongholds tsarskaya Khota commonly called the George Hunt. Here's some drone footage of that area. You can see the extent of the forested area and you can even have a clear view of the George Hunt. Like I said earlier, for weeks the front line stood along this highway and the border was essentially this bridge. The second position was the water pumping station north of the Promka industrial zone. On the 17th of January, Russian aviation bombarded this position a SDV-305 missile fired from a Ka-52M attack helicopter struck the main building of the position. All hell broke loose a couple hours after, when the Russian assault units used this old underground Soviet pipeline to storm the Jars hunt. From there, they attacked in all directions and encircled multiple Ukrainian detachments, who were now taken between Hammer and Anvil, because that's when assaults were Chokan și Nikoval, ok? Mulți dintre ei s-au predat. Also, the International Brigade, Pietnashki, with the support of the 10th Tank Regiment, captured the Skotovata stronghold. Here, in this apocalyptic scenery, you can see some of these Russian stormtroopers inside a former Ukrainian machine gun nest. Meanwhile, in that same sector, a Russian fire team is battling when a friendly drone showed up to deliver ammunition. And fun fact, back in November, the Russians already used tunnels in that same sector. The Donetsk направлении очень активно модернизируется не только в воздухе, то есть над землей, но и на ней непосредственно и даже под землей. И так как здесь хватает ребят, которые знают, что такое лопата, 
Киркова, да, 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 Шахтерский край. Сколько всегда... метров вы копали? Мы прокопали 160 метров, не сильно много. По 20 января, русские had conquered the bulk of this forested area. The same day, pro-Ukrainian deep state UA wrote, stabilization measures are on the way. If success is not achieved, it will endanger the entire eastern part of the city and its surroundings. But these Ukrainian counterattacks were not successful. Although they did manage to regain some ground in the deforested area, the next day Russian assault detachments were geolocated very deep inside the residential sector, way beyond the Tsar's hunt. With no troops on the ground that could intervene, all the Ukrainians could do was shell them and send them swarms of drones. For example, this Russian squad of nine men was intercepted by a Ukrainian FPV right here. Meanwhile, other FPV drones swarmed Russian troops in the Tsar's hunt. Reports mentioned the desperate situation the Ukrainian command was facing. Waves after waves were sent to dislodge the Russians, but to no avail. Apparently, an infantry company, roughly 100 men, supported by six Bradley IFVs and three tanks, were brought from the northern flank all the way to the south to counterattack the Russian breachhead. But despite all their efforts, they were repulsed. Not only that, but on the 22nd of January, reports appeared that the Russians had stormed the Zenit stronghold, an ex-Soviet air defense base meant to protect the airport of Donetsk. We know this because of this video that was released, where we can see Russian soldiers with Ukrainian POWs, and it was geolocated right here on the map. And apparently many of the men that were captured were part of the elite presidential brigade. Despite these reports, the mainstream media and pro-Ukrainian mappers denied the Russian capture of the Zenit air defense base. Here from Fort, on Monday, the Russians came closer than ever to cutting off Zenit with its labyrinth of concrete strong points. They failed! And that's a huge pile of coke. At the same time, the Ukraine command continued to send a lot of its reserves to knock out the Russians out of the residential sector using the 20505 road. In this video from January 25th, you can see tanks of the 116th Mechanized Brigade pushing along that road to counterattack the recently lost positions. Currently, the staging ground for all these counterattacks is the Chemik sector, also known as the Citadel. Here's a view of this area. As you can see, it's filled with Soviet-era high-rise buildings, also known as commie blocks. And doesn't this remind you of Bakhmut? Not only are the Ukrainian counterattacks struggling, but according to the latest artillery strikes, Russian infantry units have pushed all the way into this sector, which is located only one kilometer away from the citadel. And according to the latest news... Da, citadel. Tot așa aveau citadelă și în Bakhmut. Și a fost ultima care a căzut. Bine, era și cea mai uh, vestică, deci cumva este logic. The Russians have expanded control of the residential sector, with some heavy fighting taking place at the border of the Tsar's hunt. Although the Russians are increasing their focus on Avdivka proper, we should not forget the bigger picture of the Donetsk front. Although many of these battles seem insignificant, like I spoke about in the introduction, the Ukrainian command is currently building its own set of fortifications. Let's call it the Zaluzhny Line, positioned approximately 16 kilometers west of Avdivka. In my opinion, the operational goal for Ukraine is to hold off the Russians long enough until these fortifications are ready. To this effect, the main positions to hold are Krasnahorivka. If that city sounds familiar, it's just because all the cities in Ukraine have the same names. There's also the small form of Nevelske and Pervomaiske. And that explains why on the 18th of January, Russian sappers were spotted advancing in Pervomaiske. And we could expect them to continue further assaults in this sector, further south in Heorivka. So right after Marinka, Russian sapper assault groups managed to capture this church, and they were all pushed 250 meters forward. And the next day, they advanced another 150 meters. These deci, attacks mainly... No milioane, ci metri, da? Okay. Sutitrare ciudată rău de tot. ...consist of small infantry units because they are harder to detect by enemy artillery. And this alleyway type of terrain makes it very difficult for armored vehicles. Like this Russian T-90S tank that came in support, but that was hit by a javelin anti-tank missile. Lastly, the Russian storming of Novomikhailivka seems to have failed, once again due to skillful Ukrainian counterattacks. 
Now the Russians are attempting to bypass this stronghold from the north, but especially from the south. But even then, they face stiff resistance, and Ukrainian counterattacks once again have cancelled a lot of the Russian gains. That's all I have for you today. Let me know in the comment section. Mulțumesc pentru că l-ați urmărit pe Alex. Nu uita să vă duceți și la el pe canal, să-i lăsați un like și, bineînțeles, să vă abonați. Haide, pa, pa!